That's this why... conference will now be recorded. No. And that's why this uh, I'm presenting this laboratory as a set of sort of uh, projects, or uh, essentially to show you what we are doing at Nazarbayev University. And so my interests are essentially from software to hardware to neuroscience and so on. Okay. So the new paradigm computing laboratory is essentially oriented uh, or is, is constructed and structured across, uh, let's say, three different domains. Uh, maybe domains don't have the best name, but general idea that we have a domain of software, of hardware, and of human. And in this age of artificial intelligence, we would like to achieve this universal artificial intelligence in order to give us uh, more uh, time to do what we want. And we can leave something to the robot studio instead of us. So in this, uh, in this presentation, I will be essentially talking about three overlaps or how in this new paradigm computing, we are essentially trying to, uh, let's say, solve and dif solve different uh, problems of artificial intelligence. So there are three areas, as you can see, these are essentially on the interaction between each of these two fields. Between software and hardware, we have some software, hardware, co-design optimization. Between software and human, we have some software for artificial intelligence. And between hardware and software, human, we have some hardware for artificial intelligence. Okay, so let's look what exciting things can be done in these areas. All right, so the first one, we're talking the software for artificial intelligence. And Okay, I cannot see everything here. This is blocking me somehow. One second. Ah, yeah, okay. So the first area is the software for artificial intelligence. And in our laboratory, this new paradigm computing, we have currently several running projects. And these projects span from intelligence and portable sensors uh, through human computer interfaces to some theory and practice in machine learning. Now, for each of these areas, I selected one or two projects to show you uh, why is it relevant, to show you why is it important and uh, their applications. So the first one that we are studying is essentially the human-computer interaction. In a sense, uh, in a general type of sense is a human-computer interaction. And in particular, we are focusing on the different modality of human interaction. Right? Now, in generally, maybe it is known, but in general, it, is, it has been demonstrated that up to 60% of human communication is nonverbal. And therefore, if we want to have uh, robots that are successfully deployed in hospitals, that are successfully deployed in human services and so on, these robots cannot, be, cannot only understand direct commands, but should also be able to understand uh, behavioral expressions, emotional cues, facial expressions, and so on. So there are two types of communication. We call it the active communication or the passive communication. And in our laboratory, we are in particular looking to the passive communication model, which is mediated through emotional expressions. Okay. Now, this particular study or this particular project, it's, uh, it's a multimodal uh, approach. And the general idea, we, it is called the Life Feeling Communication Platform. And it is based uh, for, or it is focused at this stage, for the improvement of the entertainment system. And right now, it is even, uh, I would say, very suitable. So let's say the situation, some of you might be a very big fan of football. And when there is a game between, uh, I don't know, Arsenal and uh, Manchester or Astana and uh, Karaganda, then you want to, the best experience you can have from such an event is that if you go outside, if you go to the stadium, you're there with your friends or alone or family and you enjoy the atmosphere, you look where you want and so. However, in most of the cases, uh, well, the places in the stadium is limited, it is too far, it is not affordable or so on. So in most of the cases, people will be watching it from home. Now, when you watch something from home, and in particular, these 
uh, streamed events. Uh, what you get is a content which is delivered to you by a set of professional camera operators that will try to show you a situation in such a way so that it satisfies the most of the viewers. However, most of the viewers also means that they will probably very rarely show you uh, maybe images that are the most satisfactory for you. And this is where the live feeling communication platform comes into play. We are building a system where on one hand, we are analyzing a very large uh, or all the possible or the available streams from the cameras from a football event. At the same time, we are analyzing the user's emotional expression. We collecting data about the user's preferences. And on a, in a real-time feedback loop, we provide the user a modified content, a such a content that corresponds to his or her individual and personal preferences. So, uh, for instance, if uh, you have a situation of a attack, then some users would want to see the defender, some users would want to see uh, the player, some users would want to be more focused on the ball, some users would want to be more focused on the view from the back, and so on. And all these things, essentially, we, uh, we are working on to provide them in real time without the user having to say any explicit commands. Therefore, the importance of the emotional or the intention estimation by the computer only without any verbal or explicit commands to the machine. Yeah. Now, the uh, so this is a relatively large project. As you can see, there are many different parts connected to it. So the different uh, computation and the different modules that are required, it requires some face recognition, which is pretty much uh, just a tool, emotion estimation, which is a still an open problem, still quite difficult because it depends on many external and many internal factors. Eye gaze tracking, because we want to know where the person is looking so that we can provide the best view on a particular detail. And of course, we also do a football game prediction so that we can determine where we should show a to the user ahead of time because we are expecting some exciting actions will be happening there. And finally, we also have to do a human intention estimation, which means we have to be sure that what we are showing to human is what actually the particular viewer or user wants to see. Okay. Now, another project from this same part is, a, is from the area of remote sensor, sensors and diagnostics. And now, again, this is very timely with this current uh, stay at home, with this current uh, situation of the coronavirus. We started essentially, uh, why do we need such a remote uh, diagnostics or how is this related to a uh, human computer interface? Now, as you know, if we take the example of Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan is the ninth largest country. In the Hello? Hello? Yes. Um, okay, so the, so Kazakhstan is one of the largest, uh, I think, ninth largest country in the world with a relatively low population, I think around only 19 millions of uh, people currently uh, in Kazakhstan, and which essentially means that there are uh, locations in very many loca locations that are relatively far from medical uh, institutions or let's say medical experts, right? Now, this essentially means if there is a problem, there will be two particular situations. Either people will be waiting for a very, very long time until they're very sick and they have to, and they have to go to the doctor, which in many cases might be uh, too late for an effective treatment. It might take, uh, it might be much more expensive and so on. And on the other hand, they might go to a doctor without actually having to go. You have to a doctor, in which case it will be a waste of money, waste of medical effort, and so on. So uh, the big distance makes effective diagnostics more difficult. And therefore, a remote or telediagnostics can reduce the cost uh, both for the individuals as for the government in the, in the money spent, uh, let's say, 
for, for the medical experts. And as well, for the individual, it will increase the quality of life because the, the particular individual will go see the doctor, let's say, only when necessary. So the system that we are actually working in this area, it's a cough collector and analysis. And the idea is that in Kazakhstan, uh, due to the uh, dry air and the general climate, there is a quite large amount of uh, respiratory diseases. And these respiratory diseases, one of their, uh, let's say, one of their uh, symptom is cough. And so we are developing a application that collects coughs, allows them, let's say, analyzes them, and allows at the same time to, let's say, contact the doctor so that the doctor can essentially review the results, in the best case, directly talk to the patients, and in this way, prevent or advise the patients to either co urgently seek help or to uh, tell to the patients that it is not yet necessary. So as you can see, there are I, uh, actually there are three different parts. On one hand, we have a interface to a cell phone, which means anybody in Kazakhstan can, uh, let's say, download an application, cough into app, uh, record the data, annotate the data, and upload them to the cloud. On the other hand, we have a part of research because um, the idea is to diagnose a particular, let's say, condition through a cough is not an easy case. And there are several obstacles, both technological and, let's say, algorithmic to how to efficiently do it. And on the last end, we have also a medical expert who can essentially access the data if the patient decides to do so. Now, there is also currently, this is directly related to the corona, corona COVID-19, uh, there is a new part which is essentially added to, uh, for a user for self, uh, not self-diagnostic, but uh, self-control. And the idea is if you record coughs into these applications, you can then see if the, you, if the cough is evolving and you can use this application for sort of uh, self-monitoring. So currently the, uh, the application has been essentially one part, which is for the cough collector, for contacting to the doctor, uh, for contacting the doctor and for the data visualization has been uploaded to the App Store for the Google App Store. And we're still waiting for uh, the, Apple, 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 I don't know, Apple iStore or so on. Uh, now, so this part is essentially done, but there is much more work because the system requires a part where there will be a autonomous analysis, and that part is still uh, ahead of us to be developed. Okay, so now there are other projects. Uh, so in this, in this part, this uh, NPC software for artificial intelligence, we have seen understanding we have meta-learning algorithm conf configuration and more about reasoning. And of course, uh, this project is still open for interesting people. And these are would be, let's say, the requirements to join this project, such as, uh, in general, we look for good programmers or we look for people who have good theoretical skills and so on. OK. So this was the first part. This was the new paradigm computing software for artificial intelligence. Now, the second part is between hardware and human. And there are, again, uh, several different projects. So we have some reconfigurable VLSI. We have an algorithm selection for hardware. We have theory and practice of reversible computing. And then we have some design of quantum computers. However, before going into one of these topics, Let's see, why do we actually need hardware? Why do we need to consider hardware and artificial intelligence? So now uh, you might have already heard that it takes tremendous amount of time to train, uh, let's say, uh, artificial networks to play games or a large amount of time for networks to learn how to uh, recognize images. Uh, currently, uh, as you all know, Tesla is using one of these artificial do autonomous driving and here and there you will have people who are dead uh, whether it is by their own doing or by the software because the software is 
far from being perfect. Even with this very large amount of resources, it is still not enough. Now, in addition, it is assumed that in order to arrive to the ability or to the equivalent, to the equivalent speed of a computer for, uh, that is to the human ability, we are still far from there. Even the GPUs, even the acceleration. Now, one of the problems is that when we look at something called the Moore's law, essentially the idea is how much computer, essentially transistors, do we need in order to be uh, in order to be able to simulate human brain? We are still far from there. Now. Another problem is that if we look how far we are from there, one of the issues is that the technology that we have currently uh, reached a certain limit and we cannot go faster. We can only go more parallel, but the parallel is not enough. Therefore, new technologies emerge here and there. And one of the technology that is essentially right there and is uh, slowly gaining popularity is called quantum computing. However, quantum computing is also quite uh, specific. I will not go to all the details, but the idea is that quantum computing is essentially uh, operates on the level of uh, elementary quantum particles, such as uh, electrons, photons, and so on, and there are different rules. Yeah. So, the only thing is that if we have a classical computer and we have a quantum computer, so what do we, what do we need to do to be able to do computational? So on the left side, we have, I think it's a Intel uh, Pentium 4 processor. And the idea, so how do we do computation on that? Well, we design logical circuits, and then we take these logical circuits, and these circuits will implement some sort of function for us. And so how about quantum chips? Well, similarly, we have some experimental quantum chips, uh, much smaller scale and so on. However, a good thing is we also do computation on them by building some circuits. So if we can build quantum circuits, then, well, we can do computing on the quantum computer. OK. So what does it mean for us? So currently, uh, actually with one of our undergraduate students, uh, we are doing a design and optimization of layouts for quantum circuits. Now, there is only a very few quantum computers that are available, and one of them is called the IBM Q. Now, the problem is that when you have a quantum circuit, which is, let's say, on the left side, you have to match it to something which you can see it on the bottom right side. Now, there are several methods, but uh, this uh, young lady from, uh, from our laboratory uh, developed a graph-based algorithm where we take the circuit, we transform it into a graph, and then we apply a graph theory, in particular graph, graph isomorphism, to find a perfect match on that actual quantum computer. This way, we minimize the resources and have the best possible application. Okay, uh, so this is, I would say, the most exciting current project there. And so we have other projects, as we already mentioned, we have some high-speed uh, reconfigurable VLSI, we have a more theoretical approach into quantum automata and theory, and other, for example, evolutionary-based uh, quantum circuit design. Now, of course, if anybody is again interested to join here, the knowledge between this part for the hardware and the software is different. Here we are looking for more for people with discrete mathematics, complex calculus, nonlinear optimization um, and machine learning. And the programming is also mostly done in C, C++, and people need to know some graph theory. Okay, now let's look in the last segment. Now the last segment is the software, hardware, co-design and optimization. Now again, this part is sort of a little bit similar to the previous part is why do we actually talking when we, when we want to arrive to universal artificial intelligence about software, hardware, and co-design. Well, if we look at it, then again, similarly to the previous one, uh, on one hand, we want to do a very fast hardware to accelerate the artificial intelligence. But on the other hand, accelerating the hardware is not enough. We also need to adapt the software, to adapt the model, to optimize the model, and to compress them. Therefore, while on the one hand we have the artificial intelligence is very, very advanced, can do 
of many things, can you natural language processing, speech recognition, and so on. On the other hand, it takes a still a very large amount of memory and computation to actually obtain such, uh, such uh, let's say, such features. Now, before we even go to different technologies such as quantum, we still want to have such a features on our cell phones, on our smartwatches, uh, what else devices do you have? In, uh, IoT devices, smart fridge, and so on. So before that new technology uh, arrives, we still have, or if we still want to minimize these devices, render them, compress them, and make them as accurate as possible. Therefore, the idea is that we do some software hardware optimization, and the general approach is to say, if I have a particular model for, let's say, for learning, how could I optimize it so that uh, I could port it to a much smaller device, right? On the right side, you have a some sort of Tesla device, and on the left side, you have a cell phone. And now, if you want to be able that what is on the card does the same uh, uh, work which is on the cell phone, you have to do a lot of optimization in order to somehow reduce the amount of computation which is done on the card and can be done on the cell phone. So now, one of the projects that we are doing is the so-called optimization and binarization of convolutional neural networks. Now, this project is, this is pure optimization and the whole idea is that instead of taking an image as we see it, let's say in computers that will be red, green, blue, and process the image to a network with many, very high precision parameters, we break the image into a set of thresholded binary images and we process them through a very, very simple and very fast smaller networks. Right? Now, using this, we can reduce a very large amount of computation, but there is also a reduction of, uh, let's say, accuracy. However, for very specific, very some subset of data, this model is comparable to the state of art. So we have we are on the right track to actually provide a set of models that might be larger in space, but are much faster and can fit into smaller embedded devices while still preserving the approximate accuracy. All right, so other projects also in this software, hardware, co-design and optimization. We have some uh, pruning for neural networks. We have an uh, optimization for the learning space. And our target is to define a unified precision architecture for convolutional neural networks. Now, of course, now if anybody's interested in join, uh, in this case, this is mostly linear algebra, discrete, uh, discrete uh, computing, functional analysis, and some nonlinear optimization. Uh, and of course, advanced Python programming. Okay, now as a conclusion, uh, if you are interested, uh, this is the location, even though right now it is closed. So it is in C4411. We have a website, which is mpc.nu.edu.kz. Uh, you're more than welcome to go visit uh, and see if there's something interesting. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, for this very interesting presentation, this information. So, um, the participants, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask Professor, me. So, yeah, we are waiting for your questions. Now we are setting questions and the answer session. You can use your microphone, also you can write in our chat. Mm -hmm. Yes, any questions? <clears throat> okay, so um, as so, you know, Professor, from the Department of Computer Science, I know that this department is very popular. Uh, Okay, so here one question. What if I'm interested in some projects, but unfortunately, I don't have a relevant background? 
Um, well, again, this depends uh, from, let's say, what area do you come from? Are you a student? Are you a professional? I mean, if you are not, if you're a student, you can always gain the uh, the the experience. On the other hand, everybody who comes to the laboratory, we automatically give him or her a training. Yes. Uh, for example, as an example, uh, before this uh, COVID started, since September, we accepted a. I think he's a biology student or chemistry student. Uh, we pretty much didn't have mm, not much programming uh, experience. And uh, I mean, we, I don't know, we trained him or we taught him what you do by way giving him a project and by being supervised and uh, leading him towards uh, being a part of that project. So. As long as there is an interest to self-develop and self-improve, the basic lack of technical knowledge is not a problem. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, okay, again, one question. Is wireless telecom background and the working experience el eligible for this program? Um, so is it the program as a computer science or as a part of the laboratory? Because if it is for computer science, then I mean that really uh, CS. Yes, computer science. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that, uh, I mean, you know, if there is a wireless background, that means there is some uh, IT background and then and working experience, it is always a possible background, yes? But again, there are classes that have to be passed, right? So if you didn't have uh, some uh, classes as a programmer, well, you will have to catch up, yes? Okay. Uh, hello, thank you for the webinar. May I also ask to send me the webinar from the... Ah, okay. Uh, Aida, I will send you, okay. I will send you the previous webinars record. So, okay, so everybody's thank you, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. So, one more question. Uh, hello. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, if I can ask. No. Yes, yes, you, you are welcome. Mm -hmm. Hello. Please yeah, ask. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, if I, um, if I attend that, uh, computer a quantum computer program now now most of the computer uh, quantum computer program uh, computer is still in the lab it's, it's yes not, uh, it's not in the society so after this graduation um, what can I do like what will I do uh, job like I will uh, so... do, uh, do work in a uh, lab like uh, so the thing is that uh... Quantum computer is, uh, I don't know, right now quantum computer is maybe uh, where the transistor is in the 1950s. So it is still a uh, starting technology. But um, according to the trends, it is highly possible within 10 years, it would be something, let's say, much more tangible. Now, on the other hand, if you, let's say, you take our classes in quantum computer, this will be a valuable background into uh like one different approach how computer works and it can always be used for essentially more let's say research work in even classical computers there is a question is they uh, directly a work in kazakhstan maybe not yet like i know that in china like my my university is university of uh, science and technology of China. So it's uh, quantum physics they are very uh, working very well and uh, they are having uh, very good um, um, achievements. Uh -huh. I, so uh, my another question is like that uh, this in this university like Nazarbayev University uh, we more we pay more attention to the application of knowledge or like or writing papers or this 
Uh, my question is this. Yes, uh, I mean, yes, the, uh, both of them. I mean, uh, the Brave University is a research university, so the publication is a very big part of uh, evaluation, yes. So, uh, if there's any like big companies that are having a cooperation with this uh, university? Um, so, currently, in some areas, as far as I know, yes. In some other, no. Uh, there are some, as far as I understand, there are some uh, cooperation with, uh, let's say, software development company, uh, mining companies, oil and gas companies. But uh, mm. from the technological point of view, uh, not so much because we're mostly trying to find out local cooperations. Okay, and uh, my last question is that uh, I think in the future most of the AI and artificial intelligence computing will be uh, calculated in big computer. Then it will be sent to that uh, personal devices, like because of its uh, fifth generation communication system, it will be very fast. So I think uh, um, this uh, personal devices. Do not need to calculate too much. <laughs> well, that is true. However, similarly to 4G, yeah. even 5G we, we will not be available anywhere. Second, and this is even more serious, not everybody wants to have his own personal data calculated somewhere else. Yes? For example, independently what you can think, giving your data to Google or to big company, you are essentially losing a part of privacy, independently how you look at it. So saying that the small devices will be complete, we do not have a requirement for any computing, I don't think I completely agree with that. Okay, okay. Cool. Okay, thank you for the reply. Thank you. Um, there is a, yeah, one more question. Um, um, wait a minute. I will look at this. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for NU students only for your projects? Um, so now the so actually not really. I'm looking for any sort of cooperation. Yes, I mean students who are at the new they can come to the lab. Students who are not at the new we can have inter-universitary uh, cooperation so I guess the answer will be no not only a new mm -hmm. it depends right mm -hmm. okay yes of course it depends on qualification it depends on mm -hmm. let's say mm -hmm. is it the grant is it not a grant and so on but the basic answer is not only yes mm -hmm. so um, Altai I think you uh, like received the proper answer for this question so it's uh, okay, mm -hmm. but of course it will be better if you uh, enroll to computer science first and uh, uh, work in this project. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have any other questions, please uh, send us your questions. Um, so uh, also, um, I will be, after this webinar, I will send the record of this uh, oh, record of this yes. webinar. Then also you can send us your uh, questions to sets um, underline uh, admissions in UEDUKZ. All your questions about admission requirements and the other. Also, uh, professor provided his contacts in his last slide. Also, you can write to him about his researches um, and other things about the department um okay so uh one more student is writing applicant mm -hmm. can i advertise myself how about chinese students um what do you mean you want to work in professor uh, professor research can i advertise mm -hmm. myself yeah mm -hmm. Professor, one student is writing. He, I think he's uh, from China, so he is uh -huh. studying there. He wants. Uh, is it like possible uh, to work, uh, like cooperate uh, with you in, in your research? Yes. Uh, 
yeah. I mean, that is, yes, that is possible, yes. I mean, just uh, contact me and that is always possible, yes. Yeah, so, um, Bidu, Bik, yeah, he, your name is, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can write to professor, he provides already yeah, yeah. his contact. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, also, uh, you can oh, okay. work. So, any other question, guys? Okay. Uh, greetings, uh, you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to ask about a question about tools. Uh, what kind of tools uh, are you using for your researches? I mean, web frameworks such as uh, Django, Flask, maybe PyTorch. So, so this sort of depends, right? Uh, uh, on, yeah. the quantum, on the quantum, region, or essentially in the hardware, we will stay mostly either on a very, very low level, we will do C, maybe sometimes system C, C++, uh, we will do Python. For all the, let's say the AI in general, we, will, we are now doing Python because it's the easiest one. And then for the, let's say for the all, uh, for that software for AI, where we have this live feeling communication and, the, and this uh, cough detector. The cough detector is a multiple set of, uh, multiple set of libraries, each depending uh, for what they're doing. And the most complex is this live feeling communication where we have several uh, framework depending on what they're doing, something like web R, uh, R, uh, RT web or stuff like this. Right? But these are only tools that are that you know that can be learned. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So okay, I I have wrote here uh, in our chat our contacts. You can just screenshot it. Um, Okay, so if you do not have any other questions, uh, we would like to uh, thank uh, our professor for this very useful presentation. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank our participants for your participation to, uh, in today's webinar. Uh, so today it was like the last our scheduled webinar. Um, maybe in, on May we will have additional one more webinar with me about admission requirements. Maybe we will schedule it to May 11th, but uh, we will remind you beforehand, of course. Um, so uh, we wish you to stay uh, safe, take care. Uh, after this webinar, you will receive from me uh, oh, hello. the webinar. Uh -huh. oh, okay, so one more question here, I think. Yes, hey? Yeah, yeah. Because of this uh, coronavirus, I can go back uh, go back to my university to pre prepare my like uh, my uh, requirement prepare things for for this application. So uh, what what can I do? Like, um, is there any solution for this? What do you mean? You uh, you can't get your uh, documents. From your university? Yes, yes, yes. So, for, uh, in this situation, of course, uh, as I told before, uh, you should write. Uh, if you in the website, you can uh, you can find their admission department's contact. There is some exceptions, of course. Uh, so, could you contact uh, our admission office call center and um, uh, info admission uh, email? So, I will write now here their email address, you can write there, they will reply you. And uh, of course, they will give you some exceptions for this situation, okay? Because uh, all the documents, okay. first of all, uh, comes to admission department, not to school. So they are responsible for that. Uh, so they will give you proper answer for this, okay? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So one more question. I enjoyed the lecture and it was interesting. Also, I don't have much knowledge on hardware and software. Thank you for the lecture, professor and organizer. What is for, it for you? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, let me write here the admission department uh, quickly, admission department's um, email address. 
as mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, give me some minutes here. I'm writing. Так. Так, so this is, um, um, where is it? Um, so this is there, you can write here. You can write to this email address, your question, and they will give you a proper answer. Uh, okay, thank you guys uh, for this, um, for your participation. Stay safe. See you in our next webinar. Thank you. 11th of Bye -bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Bye-bye.